Welcome everybody to this session on COVID-19 livestock livelihoods uh, solutions for data-driven recovery. Uh, just to give a bit of an introduction, COVID has had a significant impacts on the livestock sector, particularly in low and middle income countries uh, where we're working. Uh, lockdowns have impacted food production, limited access to animal health services and medication and curbed the movement of pastoralists. Uh, at the same time, the pandemic may have had some un unexpected positive uh, benefits, uh, potentially reducing the impacts of livestock on climate and natural resources. It has also opened up a lot of new opportunities for digital interventions. Uh, many of the impacts are yet to be quantified and data-driven uh, interventions are still emerging. Again, the evidence base is still not there yet. Uh, in today's session, members of the Livestock Data for Decisions community of practice will look at some of the uh, data needs and innovations to help the sector rebuild more equitably and sustainably. Uh, the session builds upon discussions at the recent multi-stakeholder forum of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, which was, uh, was held throughout the world in many different, uh, many different sessions. So my name is uh, Michael Victor. I'm the head of communications and knowledge management at ILRI, uh, the International Livestock Research Institute, and I'll be helping to moderate today. And before we start, I'd like to introduce our uh, panel. Uh, first, we have the first speaker we'll have is uh, Esther Amosa. Uh, she's a human nutrition uh, specialist who is working at uh, ILRI as well, one of my uh, colleagues. Uh, and she's worked with humanitarian and development programs for close to 15 years and worked over 10 years with pastoralists managing malnutrition and livelihoods, uh, you know, in different settings. Uh, she also has an intimate connection with pastoralists and livestock. It's something that's really near and dear to her heart. Uh, the second uh, presenter or speaker will be uh, Ashna Singha. Uh, who is the co-founder of uh, Moo Farm, an award-winning agri-tech startup uh, working towards embracing the livelihoods of 75 million dairy farmers in India. Uh, she was recently awarded the most influential agriculture industry professional in India at the Agriculture Innovation Awards, so congratulations on that. And the final speaker we have is from Ghana, it's Awen Peter, who is a social entrepreneur, a technologist and co-founder of Cow Tribe. Peter comes from the northern part of Ghana and grew up in a family of livestock keepers. Uh, Cow Tribe is Africa's first on-demand animal vaccine delivery service provider. Uh, the company is you know, leveraging mobile technology and cow based computing to accurately forecast demand for vaccines. So we should have a, we have a really interesting lineup of speakers today. Uh, so we'd like to start the first presentation and I'd like to invite uh, Esther Amosa to uh, start us off here. Thanks, Michael. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm going to share with you a short presentation on measuring the impact um, of COVID-19 on food security and nutrition. And this is a study that uh, was conducted in the northern part of Kenya, uh, which is um, mainly uh, a vast uh, region uh, that is characterized by uh, drought and um, many shocks. So a bit of the background. Uh, the the uh, study was under a, a bigger program uh, uh, called the Accelerated Value Chain Development Program, which is a USAID-funded program covering about half of the country in Kenya in 13 counties uh, out of the 47 total counties with the aim of reducing poverty um, uh, through inclusive agricultural growth. So the livestock value chain uh, is implemented by the ILRI under a consortium of, of, of three CG centers, that is ICRISAT and uh, uh, CIP, International Potato Center. Uh, and therefore, ILRI co coordinates or implements the livestock value chain. So the, it is implemented within the, the five counties in the northern part, which is mainly a pastoral uh, uh, setup uh, characterized by movement, uh, so no sedentary lifestyles uh, or, or living. Um, and the area is, uh, has poor communication network, especially the interior areas. Uh, also poor uh, uh, connectivity uh, in terms of the signal uh, of network. Um, and also it is characterized by many shocks ranging from floods, diseases, um, and drought. And uh, it has uh, one of the, I mean, the greatest region where we have uh, uh, vulnerabilities and uh, high um, food and nutrition insecurity. 
and of course uh, with very high acute malnutrition rate. So the, this study of uh, data was collected between the 29th of May and uh, June uh, 16th. And in Kenya, we had uh, the first case recorded on the 13th of March, 2020, um, which was characterized thereafter. We had closures and uh, partial lockdowns and curfews. Uh, therefore, we couldn't do a face-to-face -face, uh, interview. Uh, we did a, a phone-based interview uh, through uh, um, uh, interviewing different respondents. We had a total of 210 um, actors that we interviewed and we got a, a response of 94%, uh, which was very high considering that uh, the region has uh, uh, fewer phone ownership and also uh, connectivity issues. So we had a qualitative data analysis that was through the key informant interviews and also quantitative data collection where we did the main uh, phone-based uh, uh, survey through uh, interviewing the producers. These are mainly the households that are the real pastoralists. So the qualitative data we collected from different actors ranging from the county uh, staff or different directors who uh, interact with the pastoralists uh, right from the vet uh, service providers, the nutritionists, the education people, the economic and finance, uh, but also we went to the market uh, settings uh, where we did the grocery stores, uh, the food kiosks and apple tours, butcheries um, and, and the rest. Uh, so the key findings we found from this study is that um, they there was a decline uh, in the volumes of livestock sold um, partly because of the restrictions of movement from county to county. And in some places we had border closures, um, therefore the, the movement of livestock and trade was curtailed. We also uh, found that there was um, a reduction in the mean number of household income um, because of restricted businesses that was happening. And uh, there was a reduction in uh, livestock uh, prices uh, for all the species. Uh, we had a close to 13% uh, drop in uh, livestock, I mean, drop in the livestock uh, uh, prices. Uh, we also had an increase uh, uh, price in foods. Uh, this is because of the low supply, but also due to the increased demand. Um, and, and we also saw that there was a reduction in consumption variety in terms of diversity, uh, reduction of uh, consumption of animal source foods and more consumption of starchy, more affordable uh, carbohydrates. Uh, we also, um, there was a reduction in the quantities uh, consumed where households skipped meals. For example, if they were consuming three meals per day, they reduced that to uh, three meal, or two meals or one per day. Uh, all this was compounded by closure of markets. We had some uh, livestock markets closed um, due to re uh, social distancing issues, uh, people lost jobs and the reduction in the time of uh, working because of the curfews um, uh, and also general um, lack of or drop in the businesses. And this therefore reduced the uh, purchasing power of the households um, and of, uh, of course reduced the income that they were getting. So some of the challenges that uh, we encountered with uh, this approach is the um, observation, lack of the observation element, uh, whereby we could not have a chance of uh, seeing somebody, you know, uh, the individual as they respond, because there's a lot of information one can get by just uh, looking at how the respondent uh, behaves, as well as the environment uh, around them. Uh, uh, for example, if uh, they tell you they have se several number of livestock, um, for those that are at home or if it's a small uh, livestock, you should be able to see them um, and other issues around uh, food availability. So by just looking, you can look at, uh, you're able to get just more information besides the, the one that you're given on phone. Uh, the other is a question about uh, quality of data, um, given that uh, all these issues come in. Um, at some point we could uh, get disrupted um, because of either the, the phones go off or the network breaks, um, and therefore we the quality is, is not as 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 good. Um, the other is issues is around phones where there are some phones are shared uh, within the households, and as we know in the northern 
part is a patriarchal setting where ownership of many things, including phones, belongs to the males, and therefore uh, getting some certain information that is specific to females uh, may be a challenge, especially if this information is given by male by a male counterpart and of course the issues around uh, uncharged phones or lack of network um, and then uh, the, the issue of uncertainty of the respondent uh, because the one that we have registered the people who are registered with the phone may not be necessarily the ones who are answering on the other end and if the phone is left behind somebody could uh, uh, pick it and just respond and therefore that 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 brings some uh, issues around that uncertainty as well as the verbal consent um, whereby if uh, uh, I mean we are not able to see this person it's on phone and therefore the ethical issues around uh, consenting or obtaining uh, uh, that consent becomes um, a problem. Uh, in terms of opportunities um, we think the, uh, the phone uh, interviews uh, can allow uh, for several uh, collection of data points and uh, high, at a higher frequency, the cost is relatively low and uh, maybe a faster way of collecting data because then one doesn't have to uh, travel uh, through uh, a poor uh, road network and uh, spend like two hours covering uh, 100 kilometers of, of a stretch. Um, and then uh, we, we think the opportunity is that uh, using the same phones, if we were to do feedback, uh, it, it would be uh, ideal to pass back the information uh, to the same respondents using the phones. Um, in terms of what this data has um, helped, uh, it has uh, supported the county governments uh, in those respective um, areas to uh, develop standard operating op uh, procedures for opening markets because they, it uh, showed the, the real need the, or the urgency to open the markets uh, because it's a source sole uh, source of livelihood uh, for the pastoralists and therefore they they were quickly uh, able to start doing that and currently actually all the closed markets are open as of today and uh, the food distribution uh, the coverage has widened uh, to save the lives of uh, especially the vulnerable including school ch going children who are the, where, whereby they were getting f food at the school uh, within the school when schools were closed were open, but now with the closure, then uh, there is that um, vulnerability. So this uh, has widened, the data has helped us to widen the coverage. Um, and of course, now the NGOs are working more collaboratively, uh, bringing in the social protection issues and the water issues and other things. Um, why we think livestock uh, is important in rebuilding um, uh, resilient uh, food systems. We think that um, uh, the, there is need to prioritize um, the livestock protection as an asset and as a livelihood, given that it it is the mainstay uh, or, or sole source of food um, and the associated income for the pastoralists. Um, but we also think it's important that uh, data is captured on pasture so that uh, the pastoralists are able to know where pasture has recharged and where it's depleted so they are able to move more strategically and adjust their grazing plans. Um, data, livestock, uh, data on livestock disease breakouts as um, frequently as, as, as possible needs to, to, to happen because uh, there was a restricted movement and some of the community disease reporters who are already collecting this data are not doing that. So we think it's more urgent um, to, to, to continue being correct, uh, collected for a timely response. Also, more disaggregated livestock prices needs to be collected um, to, to, to be very location specific because it, currently it's more general. Um, and most importantly, uh, we think we need to look at how we can collect data to inform e-livestock trading uh, because of the issues of uh, social physical distancing. Um, and also last but not least is the consumption data on consumption practices as well as the nutrition outcomes uh, so that it's able to um, inform a quick decision making given that the vulnerabilities in this region are very high. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Esther. I'd like to now uh, uh, 
have uh, Ashna Singh uh, from uh, Moo Farm to give the second presentation. Over to you, Ashna. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Ashna Singh. I'm the co-founder and COO of Moo Farm, a dairy technology startup working with smallholder dairy farmers in India uh, with a mission of making farmers prosperous. Uh, just to give you a little background about the Indian dairy industry, uh, we are the largest milk producer with 187 million tons of milk, which is around 20% of the world's total output. Um, majority reason is because we have the highest number of cattle, 300 million cattle, uh, that is 30% of the world's cattle population and 100 million dairy farmers regularly daily involved in the industry. Unfortunately, dairy farming in India is highly inefficient. Uh, our average uh, output per cow per day is four liters compared to around 30 liters per cow per day in Europe. Uh, the biggest reason is that the farmers lack access to a lot of key services uh, such as veterinary advisories for uh, treatment, health and breeding, uh, information and knowledge, nutritional and health supplement inputs, as well as financial services. Um, this entire gap has been further widened uh, because of the entire COVID-19 pandemic. To give you an example of one state, these are the headlines of milk prices going down, input costs going up, rural economy taking a huge hit. Uh, this is where a uh, move farm comes into play, uh, building a connected commerce for farmers, uh, starting with an online community platform of uh, wherein farmers can interact with peers and uh, other subject matter experts and get their queries resolved, get access to information. Uh, vet connect of connecting with qualified veterinarians, platform of cattle trading. Uh, in the coming future, of course, e-commerce where they, they can get their nutritional inputs ordered from, uh, fintech services, and uh, in the coming years, access to markets. But to give you an example how we kind of uh, set the base from uh, COVID-19 and uh, the beta, uh, uh, the, the action that we take uh, took into account uh, during the lockdown, um, our biggest feature, e -Dairy Mitra, actually evolved from uh, the pandemic's uh, need to uh, connect farmers to qualified veterinarians. So what we realized was farmers were facing this um, huge challenge of uh, isolation, information isolation and uh, lack of connect. So uh, while farmers could have normally, you know, interacted with other farmers, government agents and uh, veterinarians coming right to their doorstep, they were completely left isolated. So we started a toll-free number wherein farmers from three states of a project locations could get in touch with uh, qualified veterinarians and get their qu queries resolved. So in the uh, 90 days that we ran this operation, we had 5,000 plus calls. Digging deeper, we realized into the, into the data analytics, we realized that a majority of the queries was because of cattle health issue that they were facing and that's why they needed a, a qualified and experienced veterinarian service. This is how we used, uh, you know, the advisory service and the pilot done in COVID and made it into a much larger feature and accelerated the growth uh, called e -Dairy Mitra, wherein farmers now in, uh, it's now inbuilt in the application that the farmers can choose from a list of veterinarians, get connected to their veterinarian of choice. There's absolutely transparent and cheaper uh, pricing option available because, um, the, uh, the, the entire uh, analytics that we uh, did during the, the entire toll-free pilot, we realized and validated the fact that 70 to 80 percent of the cattle issues can be solved virtually uh, with just spending 20 to 30 percent of the cost that the farmers were usually spending uh, when they were calling vets uh, for a physical visit. Also, we realized the need for e-prescription, like a written uh, prescription if, if the veterinarians have to prescribe some medicines or injections. And uh, because there is no registry built in India, uh, we ensured that in the application that e-prescription is synced to each cattle's timeline so that we start building on a, a, a digitized cattle registry as well. Another thing uh, that we did during the COVID-19 lockdown and further expanded was the community platform called Mufam Sabha. So this is where the need 
for farmers to connect you know connect with more people to government schemes to agents to subject matter experts came into the picture and we did a, a you know a base a beta a rollout of a facebook community platform uh, wherein you know we shared regular on a daily basis knowledge videos tied up with government to share uh, a lot different forms of information and uh, you know ran webinars etc um the insights that that helped us uh, uh, the data insights that helped us helped us in the uh, entire uh, platform uh, were tremendous like just to give you an example from the this was the from the community itself we realized that there is this huge need to have like a transparent uh, cattle trading platform because out of the entire posts uh, that we had 70% of the posts were about cattle trading so this was like this one big focus group uh, and a lot of data on a daily basis coming in with 70% active farmers and what do they do when they come together at one place they start exchanging you know uh, um, uh, numbers and start interacting and uh, selling cattle and looking for uh, purchasing cattle so these are the kind of insights one example of the insights that we Uh, got from the platform and that helped us actually kind of uh, pivot our model a bit because cattle trading was somewhere like 15 months down the lane but looking at our customers need and the need of the hour we kind of pivoted the entire model and this should be live uh, like literally next month um so to talk about you know how we have normalized the use of mobile advisory services is like truly the example of eDairy Mitra and Mufam Sabha and these numbers kind of are further validating that fact uh, currently on our community platform we have 11000 plus members and growing on an everyday basis with a 44000 reactions in less than 90 days the daily stickiness ratio is around 70% which is uh, uh, absolutely also very uh, surprising and encouraging for us at the same time uh, recently when we started the a fresh a version of uh, uh, e dairy mitra a telehealth service we realized that even the daily installs uh, were into eight times from the last month so it's that th that increase has been actively happening um you know further validating our fact that uh, with with the changing times the farmers are also getting uh, used to and adapting more uh, you know mobile advisory services thank you Uh, thanks a lot, Ashina, for that great presentation about India. Very interesting. Uh, for our final presentation, we have uh, Peter Awin from uh, Cow Tribe, who will be uh, taking us through some of the work he's doing. So over to you, Peter. All right. Thank you so much, um, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, so my name is Peter Awin, and I'm joining you from Ghana. Um, I run Cow Tribe as the co-founder and CEO. and our cow tribe our main focus is on supporting farmers to have sex to access animal health services uh, using technology um so if you look at the problem that uh, farmers in africa face is not different from that of india um you have not less than 200 million livestock producers in africa who live in very very remote places and almost 80% of the services that they receive in the form of veterinary services is either counterfeit or substandard um as a matter of fact over 25% of livestock that is grown in africa is lost every year and that represents about 50% of income of smallholder farmers this is actually a big issue that is affecting every single farmer that is uh, smallholder farmers in africa and at cow tribe our mission is on how we can be able to leverage on you know uh technology tools to be able to um to deliver you know services that are needed by these farmers to keep their animals healthy our main focus is actually on vaccines and our our understanding is that um over so many years uh, you know we've had a lot of innovation in terms of uh, animal health um medications and uh, how animal health you know innovations can be able to support smallholder farmers but vaccines as one form of innovation hardly get to these farmers because of accessibility issues like i did mention most of these farmers are actually located in very far places and to be able to get vaccines to these places uh, these places you need to be able to um to maintain a cold chain system 
that allows the quality of the vaccine to be maintained until the farmer receives it. Uh, unfortunately, the structure and infrastructure in Africa is not actually able to support the coaching and everything. So our uh, mission has been to put all the necessary infrastructure uh, and logistics to enable vaccines to reach millions of farmers in Africa. So this is how we do it. Um, as a tech enabled logistics um, company, uh, our main focus is on helping farmers to use, you know, tech enabled tools. An example is a mobile phone that most farmers in Africa have um, to be able to request for vaccines. A simple step is for them to dial a code and then um, be able to choose any form of vaccines that they need. And then we aggregate all orders from different locations across, you know, the communities that we work in. And then we work through a network of lead farmers. Um, people that we have recruited in various communities to help us deliver these services uh, to farmers at their doorstep. We actually started in 2017 in August, so we are barely three years old. And this while we have actually been able to deliver to about 34,000 farmers uh, with quality and reliable vaccines. And we have vaccinated over 400,000 heads of livestock. This includes chicken, goat, sheep, cattle, in over 300 villages uh, across Ghana. And I, I, I'm, I'm so glad to say that, you know, this, this, uh, this past year, 2019, when we thought about the ways that we can scale this model to other places, we had a, a great alliance um, and partnership with the Global Alliance for Veterinary Medicine um, to be able to scale these services to about 2 million farmers in Ghana in the next five years. So uh, let me just take you through some of the um, some of the things that are, um, we have experienced as far as COVID is concerned. Um, when we um, heard of COVID in, at the beginning of the year, I think uh, we were not sure how it was gonna affect our business and that of the, you know, the farmers that we served. But as um, you know, the months went by, um, we started noticing a disruption in the supply chain of major agricultural inputs like fertilizer seeds, and other, you know, inputs because of the lockdown, you know, um, almost everywhere, you know, people were not allowed to move. Up. And because of that, most farmers could not access these services. And um, farmers were also um, challenged with the ability to pay for services because of, you know, reduced income. You know, this, most farmers actually need to sell products to be able to even afford daily you know, income, you know, um, to be able to buy other things. And so we realized because of the COVID, there was a reduced income uh, to farmers. And because of the social distancing, um, Katra particularly struggled to be able to get to farmers and deliver the services that we provide to them. Um, our services mostly require us to visit communities and then, you know, meet with these farmers, work together with them to deliver the vaccines to, and that is very much you know, require some, you know, um, personal contacts. Because of the COVID, it was really a big struggle for us to be able to travel to these communities while maintaining the social distancing. That said, you know, as a team, we, we put together, you know, a new strategy um, with a focus on how we can, you know, leverage on our existing infrastructure to provide more than vaccines to farmers because if they cannot access other services like fertilizer, even though we are only a vaccine provider, we knew that any attempt in going to, you know, um, communities will require us to bring uh, more value other than vaccines. So uh, we expanded our services to include other essential inputs uh, and, uh, and, and we provided all that on credit. Uh, we provided fertilizer seeds and other inputs to farmers uh, during this um, farming season. We also expanded to new communities, uh, even further communities that we had uh, we had not planned to go this year, um, due to the fact that you know um, we we noticed that uh, we have the capacity to be able to serve more farmers in this period, and so we just um, expanded to more and more communities to ensure that they at least have more services. Um, then I just wanted to mention that, you know, one thing that came clear is that in these tri trying times, the most affected are the vulnerable people like women and the aged. Um, generally, these people rely on livestock, a few livestock, and during the rainy season, they will sell these livestock to finance their, their crops. 
And during when they harvest, they can also sell their crops to buy livestock. So this is kind of the kind of life that they live every year. And due to the COVID um, and due to the reduced market, some of them were found um, to be selling their animals at a very reduced price. So they weren't getting value for, for the animals that they, they owned, you know. So what we did was to provide women and older people with credit facilities to be able to buy other inputs like fertilizer so that they can keep their animals, at least so that after the COVID, they can um, be able to, you know, uh, sell them at a higher price. And most importantly, we changed our delivery model slightly to allow um, us to teach farmers, you know, it's not all vaccines that require vests to deliver. And so um, we looked at ways that we can actually bring vaccines that wouldn't, uh, an example is um, an I2 Newcastle vaccine, which wouldn't require, you know, a vet to be on the ground to deliver. So we rather focused on training these farmers to, to, de to, to take up the delivery process and allow, you know, um, very less interaction by our field officers. And I, I can say that this started, you know, we didn't know how it was gonna go, but um, at the end of last month, we completed vaccinations of, of over um, um, 75,000 chicken um, as we speak. So I guess uh, these are some of the challenges that we face in, uh, in Ghana as far as COVID and livestock delivery concern. And this is how, these are the few approaches that we have taken to reduce the impact on our farmers. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for those great presentations. I think you really brought up a lot of points, and it's interesting to see across the world uh, some of very similar issues. You know, we do see reduced incomes. We see a lot of problems for the vulnerable. We see disruptions in the food supply, uh, disruptions in services, and the whole issue of travel, getting people to getting to people, and the whole social distancing. How that affects the the livestock value chain is quite interesting. So we'd like to just kind of delve into this a bit deeper and have a bit of a discussion from each of the presentations. And it'd be good to hear from everybody. We have a number of questions. I'd, I'd like to start with uh, Ashna. Uh, you know, we saw that the, you know, the farmers really embraced the technology uh, and it may have been accelerated by COVID-19, uh, but it sounds like it's also fulfilling kind of a, a need that was there pre-COVID. Do you think, or does Move Farm think that the farmers will continue to use the platform in the same rate as post COVID? Do you think it will change behaviors or they'll go back to the old behaviors? Um, uh, no, Michael, I still feel that they would be uh, using the, the platform because uh, the, what farmers value the most is if uh, any service or product is helping them either increase their profit or decrease their savings. So it has to have ultimately a monetary impact for them to actually have a long-term value of that product, right? So the entire concept of, uh, um, ve while we realize that vet veterinarian virtual telehealth sessions can be uh, successful, at least to the 70 to 80% extent, so is the fact that they realized that their problem can easily be solved, uh, for example, getting on a video call with a veterinarian. Right. Um, these things, I'm not saying that this thing was completely not present before because uh, internet penetration and smartphone penetration is really good in India, thanks to you know the really big telecom companies coming in, Geo uh, and the likes. Um, and they've already been connected to uh, veterinarians on WhatsApp. Right. So, so we we have seen that in the past that they would just randomly call their uh, veterinarian and ask something because of course they don't want them to pay it's in in my farmer's words the moment my uh, the moment the veterinarian kicks start kick starts the bicycle or, or the motorbike i feel like i've lost 2000 rupees because they are coming specially and when they come of course they will they will make sure that you know this medicine is also prescribed and you should do this as well and all of that right so and they and so they also have been uh, you know connecting with veterinarians through like WhatsApp and stuff, but it's not been organized. One, two, it doesn't leave them much choice. They connect with probably one veterinarian that is from their village because that is their reach. So um, and we have seen tremendously uh, one 
uh, biggest uh, uh, drawback that the veterinarians in India, and I'm sure it, it happens in other developing countries as well, that there is a lot of quackery happening. So qualified veterinarians are limited. Government veterinarians do not want to actually visit on ground and deal with the farmers face to face. Private veterinarians charge a lot. So this gap is actually ultimately fulfilled by quackeries, means diploma holders or you know those uh, uh, compounders at the who worked with maybe you know did one month course with the with a farm pharmacy, and they are the ones who are actually going on ground and saying, okay, we can give you instant help. Now these my farmers don't actually understand, right? The difference between a BVSC a degree holder versus someone who's just done it for two months. For them, it's like he's coming to my house and getting it, uh, uh, you know, giving me some service because he's put some kind of injection. I don't know what, but he put an injection, <laughs> you know. So that are a lot of myths that we're trying to break. And I feel like with this, it's also kind of opened up uh, a lot of avenues for them. It results in decrease in cost, which ultimately is the more money is what what matters you know to my farmers if if i had to pay 500 rupees versus i'm paying 50 rupees still my query being resolved still an e prescription that i can record will make a much you know a lot of difference great excellent thank you ashna i mean in, in just looking at that experience it kind of maybe to both first peter and then to esther uh, looking at the, you know, kind of the Moo Farm experience where they've created a lot of interesting uh, innovations in the dairy sector, do you think some of these uh, models could, uh, you know, work in Africa to work in your experiences, especially seeing that, Peter, you were looking at kind of uh, actual bringing in farmer uh, vets, but do you see some uh, opportunities to use to these types of technologies in your own work? Yeah, so I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's it's um, it's in place to say that um, uh, health and uh, animal health is a universal um, problem. Um, it's uh, it's it doesn't matter where. Um, when an animal is sick, it is sick, and if it needs to be treated, it has to be treated. Um, I guess the what has actually been very interesting to listen to um, from my colleague. Um, Ashna is the how they are actually able to use you know telemedicine to help you know uh, farmers access services from remote from a, a, a farmers in remote places. I think that has been something we we've been trying to you know perfect in our model because you know vaccine delivery it's a very tedious um, effort whatever you think of it. We haven't actually been that innovative in the way we deliver vaccine. The administration, the vaccine itself is, it's, it's innovative, but the way we administer it is, it's still way, way back in a, a centuries back, because if we want farmers to be able to access these innovations, then we have to find a way to make the farmer participate in the process. And that is why I keep saying that um, in this era of, you know, improved uh, communication, um, using mobile devices and all that, it is also time that we find a way to make the logistics easier for farmers because you cannot call a vet um, and get the benefits of, of what the, the mobile technology brings when the vet still has to come to your village, you know, drive, you know, hundreds of kilometers to come there just to give one chicken a dose of vaccine, you know. So we need to start asking ourselves what is the impact of the, the innovation, and especially at this time that farmers need us most, because um, like I did mention in my presentation, in COVID, um, a lot has been exposed, you know, a lot has been exposed in COVID. The fact that, you know, most of us, you need to do better in, in serving farmers, you know, we need to put farmers first uh, in the way that we build a system to serve farmers. And I guess um, post-COVID means that we need to sit down and access, just assess ourselves and see what have we been doing all this while and how can we not fail the farmers that depend on us most. And I guess um, it's really important to just connect to see what is working in, in the case of dairy farming. In our case, you know, um, we work with mostly you know, smallholder beef farmers who move from one location to another most of the time. It's 
completely different. Um, and it's a different perspective altogether. At one point, they are in location one, another point, they are in another location. So you really need to be innovative to be able to get them those services. But I guess there's so much, um, and this is the time for us to share these experiences and find ways to, to get this innovation to farmers. Uh, Peter, just to follow up to that, if you could keep it uh, short too, so we can move on. But it's interesting. I mean, you're, you're talking a lot about the communication aspects, but where do you see Cow Tribe acting as an information service? You know, how do you think you can improve uh, the level of farmer knowledge about vaccines in Ghana? And do you just support this and monitor uh, farmer knowledge and changes? So, uh, you know, not just as a communication tool, but as a knowledge hub as well. Do you have any quick thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So like I did mention, our model is actually embedded in um, helping the farmer, number one, to understand the problem because, you know, most farmers don't actually understand the, the main issue. You know, when you come to talk about animal health, it's really, it, you need to spend time with them, not just a month, but years to, to explain what it really means to, and then build that and stimulate that demand, you know. So that's that is embedding in our, our, our project. And we never go to communities to deliver vaccines until we are sure farmers understand and, and can work with us together. So that a lot involves knowledge sharing with farmers and not just a, a one way, it's a two way thing. You know, farmers have been taking care of their animals for, for centuries. They, they, are, they, they understand all these things. It's just that we are, we are saying that we are bringing more innovations to help them do it better. So we really like encourage you know, meetings with farmers, you know, not just about mobile technology, but it has to be a two way. You don't just call farmers, allow farmers to call you. And then if they have issues, they should be able to confront you. If they think um, what you are bringing to them is not working, there has to be that space for them to, to question your innovation, to question the way you provide these services and be able to reach a common, you know, ground. So that is at the core of our service. And um, I, I strongly believe that uh, most of us here, I also, I also seen you know some of these things working in in other countries. Great, thank you, uh, Esther. What about you? Do you see any application of uh, MUFARM where you guys are working as well? Yes, yes, indeed. And um, in some regions, uh, that's outside the livestock um, uh, regions. We have the daily value chain that is in the less uh, arid areas, and uh, we are actually using mobile phones. Um, we are linking the extension um, extension farmers, the dairy extension officers within the private sector. We are linking them to the farmers. So they are linked, the, the private extension guys are linked to a cooperative, a dairy cooperative. And then there is a, a feedback loop uh, with the farmer. So when the farmers uh, need something, then they go to this private extension person and a lot of information is sent um, to remind uh, the farmers about their cows. So they do take data about the cow. Um, uh, when they do insemination, they take that data and then they, 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 they remind the, 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 uh, the farmer when uh, they are due for a, a, a vaccination and, and all that. And they tell them to prepare for the, uh, the calf and uh, prepare enough fodder and feeds for, for the livestock. For the for the cattle, so it's um, it is being being used now in the northern part where we are challenged in terms of network. It's a bit uh, uh, tricky, so I think it will be baby steps uh, for us to get there. But it will be much easier if we could have the uh, technology penetration because the, the the areas are vast, really vast, and the the communication to the homestead is 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 difficult and given that they keep moving from location to location so if there is a better connectivity first of all and a better source of uh, 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 power to charge the phones uh, then it will be a much much easier but a bit of a long way to to get there well it looks like you know ashani might be able to uh, actually be able to bring your uh, technologies and innovations to africa as well so i'm sure they're welcome <laughs> Uh, just to kind of follow up with Esther, I mean, it's interesting, this whole issue of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of jumping the shark in the sense of going beyond kind of, uh, you know, respondents and uh, getting people to get interviews and doing it directly on the phone. Do you think the respondents prefer the speed and efficiency of the data collection compared to more lengthy face-to-face uh, -face sessions? 
uh, which consume a lot of time. Do, do I think the respondents? Sorry, yeah, come on. Like, what do you think of the respondents? Are they do they like this new form of data collection? Is it do you think that this will continue after the pandemic, or you'll go back to uh, having enumerators and doing kind of the more longer face-to-face -face interviews? Yes, last last week we did go to the same locations to do our annual survey. Uh, we went back to the face-to-face. Reason being, um, some areas that we needed to sample uh, were the coverage, the network coverage uh, was very poor. Um, and then uh, the ownership of phones was also very poor. So that, that didn't give us that advantage. So we had to do face-to-face. -face. Uh, in the COVID study, we had to drop some, some locations because of the poor connectivity and um, phone ownership and all that. So it's sort of, um, uh, the equity issue didn't didn't play out very well. So for, for now, um, uh, we may, it may be a mix a mix of both the face to face uh, in the areas that uh, the, the, those uh, structural uh, challenges is, exist, um, but the phone, especially within the, the urban centers and uh, areas that have uh, a good uh, connection and connectivity, uh, then we can do the the phone uh, phone 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 interviews. Okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, a question to all three of you, actually. I mean, it's interesting, and we talk a lot about kind of moving to digital and the issues of trust. Uh, and uh, and I just wanted to see, like, just a quick answer from all of you, all three of you. Uh, have you experienced problems uh, or trust issues due to the lack of uh, personal on the ground? And we've talked about the social distancing. Are there downsides to not having a close interface with research subjects or customers? Uh, Ashna, do you want to have a quick go at that one? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, there is there is a difference. Luckily for us, before we started as a company, uh, we did like an 18 months pilot, uh, which was called Project Move. So that is where we did a lot of uh, R&D, ground research, interacted with farmers. And that was sort of our trust building stage, right? Where we were uh, a lot of it, most of it was face to face. Uh, two things we realized that really helped us and again coming back to what Peter was also talking about um, uh, in terms of trust where we uh, uh, you know you, um, when we say social distancing everything one is um, we used to have uh, and still are planning to expand on local youth entrepreneurs or ambassadors right so initially when we were working more b2b in terms of corporate projects in uh, corporate sustainability, sustainability project. I used to have uh, one youth village entrepreneur for every two to three villages that would interact with the farmers on a daily basis, right? So he would have his own, so he would of course has to be a smartphone user, had, had a separate application and you used to visit the farmer at their doorstep. So he used to be the link between the veterinarian and the digital knowledge and the actual farmer. So this is one of the reasons we did this was because we wanted more um, women to come uh, 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 on, you know, because they are the ones who are actually taking care of the cattle. So we, if we would just and and stop at just setting up camps in the village, like an awareness camp, because of a lot of cultural and social restrictions, women would not end up, uh, you know, attending that camp, and that trust factor did not come into action and place. But when we started visiting their doorsteps, you know, our, our uh, youth representation, and he's, he was the one or she was the one, we did a all women concept as well, um, you know, who would um, build that trust because one, that person is local, is teaching them digital literacy skills, you know, making them understand in their own local regional language. All of these things really kind of uh, played, you know, a, a big role in setting that trust. Second thing also, uh, you know, your first question when you said uh, some distrust or, you know, uh, especially where data is concerned. Yes. So apart from the recent features that I told you, which which kind of accelerated due to COVID, our uh, uh, application also uh, offers typical cattle and uh, farm management. So the farmers can record their daily milk sold and uh, expenses, etc. And they get like a typical daily or a weekly monthly graphs on are they in prof are they up or they or they down, right? So uh, uh, initially we we faced tremendous challenges on why should we give you our income data, 
right why do why are you asking this are you from the government are you from the tax authority will you will you charge this or will i be in some kind of trouble so you know these these kind of challenges we we did face and and a lot of different uh, challenges because it's not easy uh, you know to actually uh, get data from the farmers so we it, one good uh, idea is to incentivize farmers so we have a concept called moo coins in the application so every data that they enter and every activity that they do they get a loyalty uh, points so they they feel so basically we are rewarding them for their data so that okay. it's valued yeah okay great uh, just a quick uh, kind of comments from uh, both peter and uh, esther about your kind of thoughts about trust again just quick quick responses yeah so uh, let me go um so for us um covid has been a net positive for us um, um I, i must say that it's actually allowed us to be to be able to build more trust with farmers and um, like like i did mention in my earlier presentation um due to covid we actually had to find ways to work and allow farmers to lead the process other than we bring in you know things to them um and so working with them in various strategies um we we have a model called the lead farmer model where um farmers would actually you know turn up and say i want to lead my colleague farmers to be able to access services from car tribe and then uh it reduces the chances that we have to travel longer distance to look for farmers that are interested so i guess uh, if we look all around i think we have built more trust during covid you know being the the fewer people bringing services to them and showing our commitment to continue to serve them it has actually um made us look better in the face of farmers than we had in the previous years so i guess um that that i would not i would not count that as a downside of covid i i i definitely think that covid has uh, brought that opportunity for us to work harder to gain more trust from farmers and yeah um moving forward i guess we would have to find ways to even make it better as we move out of covid yeah we built a lot of social capital it sounds like during covid as well that's great huh, wow a really interesting discussion everybody so we're going to have to unfortunately uh sum it up right now one final question we have uh is you know this has been a really challenging year and what do you think you'll be doing differently in a year's time based upon this experience uh Ashna, do you want to give us a quick response for that? Um, yeah, I feel like I, I'm going to be using my uh, community platform as more of a focus group and do all my experiments there and try to understand exactly what my customer needs and uh, you know in what form. Yeah. Great, excellent. Then Peter. Yeah, I I think I would I would say the same. Um I think uh COVID has reminded us that we actually need uh each other than um than we had we had um thought, you know. So being able to build um a synergy alliances with different actors in the field and to be able to do more with with with, with um each other than, you know, working in silos. I think uh in in a year's time i hope that we would have more partnerships across you know different places that will allow us to share knowledge about what works and what doesn't work because that is the only way that we can bring more more services and more uh, value to the farmers that we serve at the very remotest places in the world thanks peter uh, esther just a, a, we're going to do a final quick question rapid fire response from you you know this has been a challenging year and what do you think you're going to be doing uh differently uh in a year's time based upon the experience that you've had this year uh what i've realized is the it is important to collaborate with different actors along the value chain these are the private sector the ngos on the ground the government uh, and other development partners it is important that we work together because um everybody has their comparative advantage and they have different areas that they can support to comprehensively support the resilience of a, a pastoral uh, pastoralists and their their livestock well that well, that's a perfect note to end on i think you know that you know if we're going to build back better we have to build back better together uh so i just like to to finalize the session and really thank the three of you for really interesting presentations and some great insights is to really how the livestock sector is really going to contribute to building back better 
uh, all over the world. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you for this great session. Bye-bye. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Bye.